stand with me tonight as we welcome the presence of God into this place. Hey, I'm going to stay. I'm going I'm to start with that song tonight so you guys can stay right there. <laughs> Why don't we welcome God into this place tonight? God, we worship you, Lord. And we thank you for your presence, oh God. For we gather here, Lord, to worship and honor you this night, Jesus. Oh, we praise your name, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to your name. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Worshipers, we sang what they're playing. Above all else, I must be saved. Lord Jesus. For above all else, we must be saved, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, do your work in our hearts, oh God. Go before us, Jesus, and make our path straight, Jesus. Save us, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we worship you, Jesus, and praise your wonderful name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. 
Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, at different stages in our life, uh, certain things seem so important to us. Anybody remember your teenage years? Woo! Long time ago. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember I used to hate being tall. It was the worst. Being a girl and tall when I was a teenager was the worst. Because what's important to, to teenagers? Fitting in. And if you're a girl, it's a boy. And if you're a boy, it's a girl. And tall girls usually are taller than the boys. <laughs> oh, it was, it was the worst. And, 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 and I had big feet too. <laughs> you know, height, feet, they kind of go together. You know, you gotta balance this thing out. That was the worst. Uh, it was tragic, you know, the things you get all hung up on when you're young. And it really means, if, you didn't, if I didn't have, you know, the right clothes to wear to school, you know, suddenly I was sick. You know, I, I didn't want to go because, you know, it, it was important that you fit in. And, 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 you know, as we get older, those things change, but there's still things. Right now, I like being tall. No offense to you shorties, but I wouldn't want to be short for anything in this world. <laughs> Right, Bath? No, I'm teasing. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine, you know, <laughs> being up in glory. You know, I, no, no, I like being tall. <laughs> and, and, and my shoe size, it really doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. Now, it doesn't bother me a bit. But I mean, really, it was traumatizing as a teenager. And uh, all I'm trying to say is when you get to heaven, you're not going to care about what size you wore or what clothes you had on or, or even the thing, even your finance, whatever you're facing right now that's like this great big ginormous issue for you. You're not going to care. You're not even going to remember it probably when you get there. It's going to pale in comparison to his glory and to being there. It's, it's just not going to matter. And uh, so above, I don't know about you, but above all else, I want to be saved. Big feet, tall, broke, whatever it is, I just get me to heaven, right? <laughs> you know, I, I want to be there. And I like walking this walk with Jesus because every day is new, if you will. He says his, his mercies are new every day. When you wake up in the morning, and you know, yesterday was a bad day, but when you wake up in the morning, God gives you a fresh start all over again. You know, he's with us always. And worship members be saying, every day with Jesus, and I keep falling in love with him.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for your tender mercies, Lord, and your loving kindness, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Praise your name. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Worship members be saying, Jesus loves me. Thank you for your love, Jesus, for your mercy and your kindness, Jesus, for your great grace, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jeff, Jesus. When we all get to heaven, that's been the theme of the day. When we all get there, worship must be saying that. <laughs> sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, heaven being the goal, we ought to pray for one another. Yeah. Many trials do fall across our way. And not only trials, but just day-to-day busyness. And it's easy to get off focus, you know, just to get caught up in your job or your family or whatever the things are that go on in life. And, uh, you know, you have to make a concerted effort to keep your focus on Jesus. You really do. If you don't have a plan, if you're not determined, if you don't make that effort, I mean, that, I think that was kind of the part of the list that Steve, you know, put up here today to keep our focus, help keep our focus, you know, wake up in the morning. What's the focus? What's the goal? You know, what are we trying to achieve today? I mean, I know we have to live here, but the end game is heaven. And so we ought to pray for one another. We ought to pray for one another, you know, for our strength and for our focus and, and all those things because, you know, it can be for us all. I think God said if he doesn't shorten the days, even the very elect can be lost. And um, so as we go to the Lord in prayer tonight, pray for one another. You know, we all want to make it. We want, and not just us. Hey, there's plenty of room on these pews. We want this place packed out. Yeah, we, we want to have to pull the chairs out and stack them all up here and all down there and, 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 and you know, whatever. We want to, we, not just for the number's sake, but these are souls we're talking about. Not only do we want to get to heaven, we want others to get to heaven. That's what this is all about. That's what it's all about. I mean, each one of us are uniquely position to reach a set of people. Perhaps talking to people can't meet, can't, I would just talk their ears off. They would just go off running somewhere. You know, if you're quiet, God has a set of people he wants you to reach. Or well, in your family, your community, whatever your connections are on your, your job. And a lot of people say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit my job and go evangelizing. Yeah, your job is a field. Yeah, that your, your, your cubicle, your, you know, whatever, your, your warehouse, your, you know, wherever you're working, those are souls. And as we get up in the morning, as we pray, and as we focus, when you go out, you're going out on that mission for Jesus. You know, at the water cooler. That's a thing, right? And they talk about the water cooler. I don't know what, I think the water cooler is supposed to be a place where people gossip or what, I don't know <laughs> what the water cooler deal is. But you know, at the water cooler, we get to share Jesus. Yeah, I, am I, am I um, we have this break area, and there's always a bunch of guys in the break room when I come in. And every time I come in, there's one particular guy, he's in there, he goes, all rise. <laughs> I'm like, what is that all about? <laughs> I, I mean, every time I walk in the break room, the guy goes, all rise. And you got to, you know, it's really funny because the guys, they sleep in the break room. You know what I mean? They, and they just goof it off, you know, and, and, and here he comes, you know, he, he could be half sleep himself. He goes, all rise. It's, it's just, it's just funny. And, and I think somehow that's saying to the guys, Oh, here she comes. Straighten up. Here she comes. And I'm like, man, when did I set that standard? You know, but you never know. People are watching. People are listening. People know what you stand for. If you're standing for him, people know. So it's okay. Yeah, because when you walk in as light into a dark place, the darkness should say, all rise. <laughs> you know, lights in the house, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm believing God for, for big things. And I hope you believe in God for your family and for your community. And, and I'm, just, I'm just excited about what God's going to do in, in, in my life and each one of your life. But it's all for his glory. So remember, as you go about, man, I, I forgot I was talking about prayer. <laughs> yeah, pray for one another that we can be light in this dark world. Um, I know um, I haven't heard an update on Sister Jan, but I, uh, I think she's doing okay. Miranda, you up there? How's your grandma? All right. All right. I'm telling you, she's a Timex. She takes a licking and keep on ticking, right? <laughs> God is good. And uh, Brother Wayne's back in the house. All right. God is good. <laughs> God is good. As we go to him, uh, remember the testimonies of the Lord. God wants you to remember what he's done so that you can believe him for the things that are yet to come to pass. Believe God. So let's take our knees to God in prayer this night. Jesus, we thank you, God, for another opportunity to bring our knees to you this night, God, and trust you with them, God. Lord, we ask that you would bless each and every one of us, God, as we go out into this world as ambassadors for you, God. Be with us, Lord. Guide us and lead us, O oh God. 
oh, reach, help us to reach souls, oh God, to be a witness to you in this world, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, be with those who are hurting in their bodies, oh God, who, are, um, who need comfort at the loss of loved ones, Lord Jesus. Oh, comfort us, Lord. And be with us, Lord, as we go about your business in this world. Be with us in this service tonight, O oh God. We know that there's work that you want to do in each and every one of us, Lord. Give us that measure of faith to move on it, Lord Jesus. Oh, bless Stephen, God, as he brings your word this night. Oh, God, anoint him. Minister to him and through him, O oh God, and give us hearts to receive your word, O oh God. We believe you, Jesus. We believe you, God, for the things that you want to do, Lord. And we thank you, God, for hearing our prayers this night, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. Take a moment to do your meet and greet. That's what I call that goofy. Order in the court. <laughs> All rise. <laughs> I thought you... I get louder. <clears throat> All right.
I don't know about all rise. How about all sit? <laughs> Amen. Let me uh, mention to you just a few announcements. Um, I mentioned them this morning, but just draw your attention to it is that uh, this week we do have our regular schedule as far as services and also discipleship classes. We are in the last two weeks of our discipleship classes, so uh, please be attentive to those and make sure you're there so you can finish those up. And that also means that those of you that are interested in participating in uh, either level one or level two of our discipleship classes uh, in the spring need to fill out one of those survey forms back on the r my right, your left, community board. They're right there below that board. Uh, just leave it there. Fill it out and leave it there telling me, give me some indication as far as scheduling, and then we will do the best that we can to schedule to optimize your ability to attend. Um, if you don't, don't mark it, I'll assume and know that you're level one. If you actually have done level one and would like to do level two, just mark a two on there, and then I can know that, and uh, we'll publish those. Tentatively, we will start that the second week of April, so we will take uh, a week off and then start that the second week of April. All right, so help me out with that. And then also, uh, as you know, this Saturday there's men's prayer breakfast. There is a map posted on the board. If you would like to carpool, if you would check in with my dad, and uh, even if you're not going to carpool but are planning to attend, please check in with dad because we need to be able to communicate how many are going. All right, that way they can prepare breakfast for us. Um, so please let dad know that uh, either tonight or on Wednesday, but it would be preferable if you take care of it tonight for us. And uh, also there is ladies weekend, or uh, excuse me, ladies conference retreat that is happening in May, but the registration deadline is April 15th. And uh, we have $300 that has been awarded to us because of our giving to uh, the ladies offering. And so once all of you ladies have signed up and registered, we will be refunding you a certain amount based upon however many sign up. We'll divide that $300 among you. And uh, so take a look at those. There are cards out there to pick up with regard to that. And so you want to grab those and pick those up. And um, I think that about covers it. I've had several of you requesting that I preach short tonight. One side of me, I already planned to. And then when you started asking me, I started getting a little riled. <laughs> Must be the Beardsley in me. I started going, hmm. We'll have you out of here in time to take care of everything. And uh, I am aware that we got weather coming in. And so we will, we're going to sneak another one in under the wire, folks. And then you can get home and get warm and snugly, put on your fuzzy pajamas and sit by the fire and weather another snowy night. Amen. We're going to wait on you for your offering. If you'd come, the ushers, help us receive the offering. Amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being faithful. And I uh, encourage you, thank you to all of you that showed up earlier today. Maybe it was as early as I asked you. Maybe it was just earlier than you normally do. But it was nice to come down here about 10.15. And it didn't look like we uh, were going to have no one show up. You were all here. You were engaged. You were interacting with one another. And uh, remember this week, put the Lord first. Give him the opportunity to give you somebody to witness to. And just tell him what you know. You don't have to make up anything. You don't have to be a preacher. In fact, please don't be a preacher. And uh, just share your witness and your light with them, and it's going to be exciting what God can do. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you, Lord, that we can give. We bless your name, and we ask you to guide us, Lord, as we give and as we use it for your kingdom. Bless us now, and I pray it in Jesus' name. The church say amen. amen.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you and I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise God. You may be seated. Praise God. I want to talk to you for a little bit tonight um, on this topic. Embracing change. I want you to think for a minute about that. Let it resonate in your mind a little bit. Embracing change. We all know that you can really mess things up if you embrace the wrong change. If you embrace the wrong change, you can have a mess. Whether it's in your own life, whether it's in the life of a church, whether it's a community, a nation, if you embrace the wrong change. In other words, all change is not equal. All change is not the same. And Christians have recognized because of the scriptures, and rightly so, that there are some things that should not change. There are some things that they should be identical between the time of the Apostle Paul and today. But the reality is, is that in the world in which we live, in the world that God created, God did not create a static, meaning non-changing world. He just didn't. I don't know how much we're messing up the weather. But this winter is not the same as last winter. I should get a rousing amen. amen. <laughs> Things have changed. Yesterday was short sleeve shirt weather. And tonight we're headed home for fuzzy PJs and the fireplace. Because snow's coming down. Change. God created a world that is dynamic. It is not static. Change occurs. Uh, I'm going to get to the scripture in just a moment. But the reality is <laughs> that from the moment you are conceived... Until the moment you breathe your last breath, every step between those two is full of change. Some of it's good, some of it we like, and some of it we don't like. Some of you elders, you just don't like the changes that are happening. But changing they are. I like. The other day, let me give you a little background of this. The other day I, I pulled up. And Pop doesn't say this very often to me. You know, my dad's pretty hardcore. He's usually more prone to bust my chops than he is to compliment me. Hey, I get the benefits though. And, uh, but the other day I pulled up, I don't know what he'd had, I don't know who he'd talked to, I don't know what he'd had interaction about, I don't know anything. But I pulled up, I was coming to get the snowblower. Should have left it up there. <laughs> now you're going to be bugging me tomorrow to get it back up there. Anyway, I was coming to get the snowblower. Yeah, you want me to do it. <laughs> you're not that old. <laughs> I'll bring you the snowblower. Um, so I was coming to get the snowblower, 
and I pull up, and, and Pop, has anybody ever noticed that Pop likes to run things? Has anybody ever noticed that? He, he has, you know, I think what it is is psychologically, his dad walked out at nine, and that little nine-year-old grew into an old man immediately, and Pop just grabbed the bull by the horns, and he's been running life ever since. And even when he raises very competent people around him, he then struggles to let them be competent. So I pull up, literally. So you understand, this is how we live. I pull up, and the Honda is pulled into the driveway. So the snowblower's at the top. The Honda's pulled into the driveway. He and Mom are leaving. They're going to get glasses for something. I don't know. For you? Was it glasses for you? And uh, so, so he, he says, do I need to move the Honda? Now, you got to understand that I had already talked to him on the phone. And we'd had the discussion, and I said, no, Pop, I can move the snowboard around the Honda. Just go do your business. So he's standing out there. It'd be easier if I moved the Honda. I said, Dad, get in your car and leave. <laughs> I have two boys in the back of the... We will handle it. And so I guess that jogged his mind. I guess that... And he yells back at me because he was fighting with me a little bit. You know, he's going to move the Honda. No, go, leave. Stop bugging me. Goodness. And so he yells back to me across the... He says, thank you for taking care of your business. <laughs> and he wasn't being sarcastic. He literally said, thank you that you're not dumping on me. That you're, that you're taking care of your life. Now, at that moment, I was like, well, let me get, get in the car and I'll take care of the snowblower. Stop bugging me, for goodness sakes. But change, I like that part of change. I like running my life. I, 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 if you're a young person, It'll be nice when you finally find that one you can marry. My wife and I, now all of you old people, maybe you won't plug your ears, but my wife and I routinely say, boy, we really like being married. Sex is great. <laughs> Can't be TMI. One, two, three, four, five. It's a no-brainer. I like change in that aspect, but you know, the fact that I had to remind myself that the old man still had it when at 4 a.m. Ryan and I left and Ryan was dogging a little bit and I was still doing okay, that would have been a no-brainer 15 years ago. Monica, you remember those lock-ins? You all slept. I didn't sleep. I stayed up the whole blooming night. You all would lose stamina. Didn't think anything of it. So there is change that I like. There's change that I don't like. There's change that's good. There's change that's bad. But in the reality of it, as we read the scriptures, we know that there are some things that need to not change. And as Christians, we recognize this. And, and, and I think that there are times that when we recognize this, we have a knee-jerk reaction and we grab scriptures like Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let me ask you a question. If Jesus was here today, do you think he'd be wearing a robe? I seriously doubt it. The early church, when it was first established, because of culture, because of custom, because of structure, because of empire, they did not meet in buildings like this. They met in homes. I often, I think, really funny thoughts. Now, stay with me. This is an odd thought tonight, but just stay with me. And hopefully it won't take me too long once I get this intro out. Um, I have to have funny thoughts. I would love to have the Apostle Paul here. Because the Apostle Paul is another one like my dad. He was used to running everything. He was a bossy little Jewish boy. If you read it, he, he's just a bossy little fella. Okay? And I, I like him. I kind of identify with him. I kind of understand about trying to boss everybody around. But it would be really funny for the Apostle Paul to walk into church today. 
Because there's a lot of things that have changed. Some of them might be bad, some of them might be good, but he would have to really rework himself. Because I promise you, first of all, he would walk in and he would not be looking at, most likely, if we understand our history correctly, he would be confused because he can't find the men's section and the women's section. Let alone him trying to figure out what's up with that or this. Like I imagine the Apostle Paul standing here doing this for hours. Wow. Dusk to dawn. <laughs> I mean, stuff that we just take for granted have changed. I mean, I, technology, you know I like technology. I like to play around with it. And, you know, the, the old days were, you know, an old copper line, a telephone cable line, and you had this old modem. How many of you remember the crazy sounds those things would make? <laughs> just to get a lousy 56k connection and now a piece of glass in constant in constant in sheathing and so forth but a piece of glass brings me well I don't even know how to do the conversion from kilobits 56 I don't even know how to do it. It's just, it's, it's, it's massive to what, I, I don't, yeah, but it's, it's too many. It, we're now to 56 megabit. I don't even know how, I don't even know how to make the conversion. It's just astronomical of what is brought into this building. And then I turn around and take that signal and I am able over air. No wire, no, over air. I'm able to shoot that across our parking lot and pick it up in our fellowship hall. And the lousy speed I'm getting in the fellowship hall is blazing compared to what I used to do over a copper line, that 56 connection. Change. So we, we have a tendency as Christians because we know there are some things that should not change. And remember tonight, I'm here talking to you about embracing change. So obviously, I'm not here to talk to you about the things that shouldn't change. And if you want a question about those, your best friend is to go to the Scriptures. But we tend to at times take the Scriptures and we tend to lock down. You know, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm... This is the creator of the universe, and he built into his world that he maintains change. I know that some of the change that we experience within our bodies is due to sin. It's due to our trek towards death. But he built change into the way the earth works. And in Isaiah, now the context of this is, is very broad, and I don't want to spend um, a whole lot of time in that context, but in talking to Israel, and prophesying to Israel, and there are other examples of this, but I'm going to use this one passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter six, uh, 43, and verse 19. He's talking to Israel. They, they, of course, punishment has come to Israel. God's constantly tussling with them about their commitment to him. And in the midst of this prophecy, through the mouth of the prophet Isaiah, he says, I am about to do something new. This is God speaking. I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? Now, the rest of the verse goes on in particular. I want to simply lift this and ask you a question. When God does something new, do you get excited or do you get nervous?
In order to do something new, you do not have to destroy what should not be changed. That is a false choice. And young people have long mixed that up. They come in, they realize something new should happen. They realize that something should change. And so then they assume that you got to tear down everything else in order to make something new. That's a false choice. Right. Don't make that choice, church. All right. Let me use a practical example. A lot of people would have looked at our sound system and said, this is a piece of junk, it's 20 years old, and we just need to change it. And change it would mean everything got thrown away and everything became new. And that would have been stupid. It would have been stupid because it would have cost us more money. But it had been really stupid because there were some things about that original sound system that were done so well that we don't want to mess with them until we are forced to. For example, our original sound engineer hung those speakers nearly perfect for this building. And my dad and how many other guys? Two? One other? There are two of you? Just two of you were holding that thing up there? Oh, no wonder you were belly aching. Because that sound engineer, Mr. Strickland, was walking around. There, there were no pews, but he's walking around with a meter in his hands. And then he would go, I need it over a quarter of an inch. Now, my dad's used to doing government work, and a quarter of an inch don't matter. <laughs> he's quiet. Did you see that? Mark it down. It's a first. No, seriously, he's up there. Now, those are heavy speakers. But, but Mr. Strickland knew that because of this building and because of its liveness, because even when I don't know, even with huge in this place, and with you sucking up some of the sound, a normal voice can be heard across this world. Let alone when I project. So he knew that we could make a real mess if those speakers weren't hung correctly. So when Ryan and I started talking about this, one of the things, as I said, I said, Ryan, part of your job is, is that we've got to figure out somehow what needs to change and what needs to stay. What's good and what's antiquated. For example, I don't know if anybody, and I can't remember if this is true. I have heard that this is really true. But a daughter asked a mother, why is it I'm cutting the end off the ham? And the mother says, I have no idea. It's because your, your grandmother told me. So they both went to the grandmother and said, why do we cut the end off the ham? Does it make it cook better? Does it make it taste better? What, what's the secret? And grandma begins to laugh. Grandma looks at him and says, oh, I just always cut the end off the ham because the pan I had didn't fit. <laughs> Can I break some news to you? Go ahead and leave the end on the ham. That's something you can change and there isn't a problem with. But then there are other things where you do change and part of the key to embracing change is to do so without destroying those things that must not change. They are what lend the stability. They are what keep things on an even keel. They are the things that then allow the new thing to occur. I need to declare to you that the idea that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever means that he never does anything new is wrong. And the reason we're concerned that that's what it needs to mean is because we're assuming that in order to do something new, you have to destroy what came before it. That's stupid human logic. Because sometimes the something new that God is doing was already there in potential. 
And all he's doing is bringing into revelation that which was already present. In other words, if Jesus showed up as opposed to Paul, I do not anticipate that Jesus would stand over here going, ooh. Even though he lived in a time in which there was not electricity, there was not lights, there were not these kinds of things, this was not totally new to him. Not because of just his sheer power or his ability, but because all of the world, in other words, everything that we call new is inside of him. But that doesn't do us any good. From our vantage point, new stuff happens and it usually freaks us out. We don't tend to like change. Hang with me. Um, I remember when I got the idea, because we were having trouble making sure our children were secure and bringing them over. You're the whipping boy tonight, Dad, in case you haven't picked it up. I'm, you know, you, you got the pulpit next Sunday, so. We were having trouble a number of years back getting our kids over safely. Some of them would run ahead of the teachers, and there was just a safety problem bringing them across that parking lot. And so my wife and I were trying to figure out, she is a Sunday school superintendent, I as, I don't even think I was, no, I was pastor then. Um, but probably newly pastor, very, very newly pastor. And so I, I, we were trying to figure out how can we better, better do this. And so I came up with the, I don't know, bright idea? Maybe, possibly, I don't know. I came up with the idea, I said, okay, why don't we, instead of bringing the kids to the parents, why don't we tell the parents, go to your kids? It takes care of liability for the church because obviously we hold on to them and care for them until the parent takes guardianship of them. We won't leave them, leave our premises, so the parents drop them off, so why not pick them up? And I don't even remember his arguments, but I remember sitting around my dining room table, and when I brought it up, my father, in his typical fashion, very strongly said, this is not going to work. This is a mistake. And he used some other strong terms that, you know, just, not cussing or anything, just strong terms. <laughs> I could just see you all going that he was, like, cussing me out or something. No, 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 no. Just telling me with beardsly vim and vigor. That this was not the right way, and this was going to be a problem, and this was going to be a problem. He was wrong. But the goal, of course, was that the kids be secure. <laughs> so they were until the parents arrived. I know. Hey, I'm whipping up on you tonight, so it's okay. You can, you can have a little fun here. It was change. It was change. I remember back when my dad began to be burdened. He was pastor. I was just simply assisting him at the time. And he was burdened. He was bothered um, about the fact that on Sundays, people weren't emphasizing, weren't focusing upon God. And so he wanted to make that point very strongly. And so he wanted to emphasize that Sunday is God's day. You need to organize your life as best you possibly can. There are those that are the exceptions, but people, you, you need to be given Sunday to God. You need to be focused upon it. And it hit him that he couldn't really do that when he was taking certain population of our church and asking them to do things that were good, but they were things that were distracting them from their focus on God. And it was our Sunday school teachers. So I'll never forget, Regina and I were both here, us sitting in that meeting. And you can imagine that for, at that point, 20 years probably, we'd had Sunday school on Sunday morning. So he informs these teachers that it's going to ship. And... And, and they, they all began to discuss it. And they began to discuss the pros. And they began to discuss the cons. And one wise lady, I'll even name her, Sister Betty. She just sat back there in the back. Now let me tell you something about Sister Betty. This lady has an opinion. She's like the rest of you. She's got opinions. And she don't have any problem speaking them. 
But she also has another gift, and she's always had it, and I've always appreciated this about her. She's always had it. She's smart about when it's an already done decision. She has a perception of being able to figure out that it's already decided. And so Sister Betty must have been sitting in the back. I don't remember you piping up about anything until this moment. But she perceived that it didn't matter what anybody thought. The pastor on this one had already made up his mind. And I remember her raising her hand. And I remember her looking at all of the teachers and saying, Guys, we really are wasting time right now. Because we're discussing this as if it might not happen. And if you look at the gentleman at the front, it has already happened. <laughs> so now we've got to grapple with how do we embrace, this isn't her exact words, but how do we embrace the change? How do we navigate the change? Now it does make it a little weird to have Sunday school on Wednesday night. Sunday, school, Wednesday night. So we had to come up with new names and it, it, it's a little odd and people look at us funny and there's a lot of dynamics to that. But there were some very positive outcomes of that change. Now I've used some examples that are practical if you will. But what about when God, not administration, and God can use humans to, to carry out things. But what about when God initiates change in your life? I ask you again, does it freak you out or do you get excited? Because if we are to be what God has called us to be, the vision he's given to this congregation will require that we change multiple times. Now let me be very clear. I ain't talking about the doctrine. Because it's not changeable. And when you do that, you're stupid. Okay, I'm talking to the church tonight, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be kind. When, when people have felt in order to be more effective in their mission, they must change the doctrine. I'm sorry, you're stupid. You are lacking the ability to slow down and do the hard work of maintaining what should not change while finding a way to change or do something new that should be done and do it in a way that doesn't destroy what should not change. It's just stupidity to do it. Amen. So I'm not talking about doctrine. Repentance is eternal till heaven. Which means it's not eternal. It, is, it, is, it lasts until heaven. It's a requirement of sin. You don't have your sins washed away and forgiven unless it's in the waters of baptism in the name of Jesus. I find nothing in what God is doing that is removing that. You need his spirit. You've got to, wait for it, become a new creature. The way you become a new creature is the way that God set it up and he hasn't changed it. There are things in this world that have not changed. Now, I don't know whether we're going to learn how to have babies without mothers and fathers. But so far, all we've done is dabbled at the edges about how we carry it out. It still requires a father and his seed and a mother and her seed. No matter what. Because there's some things that don't change. But I promise you that my wife or Marcus, one or the other, would be dead if some things hadn't changed. Because Marcus somehow and I don't know how because this is the stillest little boy you've ever met. But he got that cord wrapped around him twice. So that umbilical cord was wrapped around him twice. 
because Vincent was born by Caesarian due to error in reading what his butt and his head were. You can draw whatever conclusions you need to about his head and his butt, but anyway, that's, that's why he was born that way. Caleb, we were able to VBAC, vaginally deliver after Caesarian, and so we were trying for that for Marcus, because we still thought maybe we were going to have six or eight or something crazy number. And so we were trying to optimize it. And every time they would try to turn Marcus in the womb, the monitor would tell us that his heart would go into, into um, trouble, distress. If we didn't have Caesarean as an option, either my wife would have died of exhaustion trying to deliver this baby boy, or this baby boy would have died due to the process of squeezing down on him, and as she did that to pass him, it would have strangled him, for lack of a better term. I'm glad there was some change. I like Marcus. I'm glad he's here. So ladies and gentlemen, I ask you again, when God does a new thing, I know the scriptures say there's nothing new under the sun, and I understand what the psalmist, or what, the, the, what, the, uh, what Solomon was writing there. But you've got to understand something, that the fact that we are born from above, that we have a new birth experience, is by definition a new thing. The first time it ever happened was on the day of Pentecost. And it happens new for every single individual. So there are things that do not change and must not change. And then there are things that do change. How do you and I respond to the movement of God when it involves change? I remember one time asking Brother Bernard when he was in, one of the times that he was in with us, I remember asking him one time how he handled administering the church and in, in, in what he was doing. And, and he's a totally different church in a totally different location. But I remember his, his answer to me. He says, I try to foster a climate of change. Now this is a man who is known worldwide for what? His doctrinal book. This is a man that when he became general superintendent, stepped to the podium, looked at a United Pentecostal church that was having some trouble knowing for sure where it stood doctrinally. There were elements within us that were trying to change us with regard to the doctrine. And he stepped to the podium and he said, you know what I believe, go read my books. In other words, what I wrote before is what I believe now. But he said when it came to the church living and breathing, doing the work that the, that the body is supposed to be carrying out. There needs to be a climate of change. And by that, it doesn't mean that we have to constantly be changing. But rather, what I would submit to you is that when change comes, we cannot afford to react the way we typically do to change. I don't like it. I'm nervous by it. I'm scared by it. I don't want to do it. We need to do it slowly. We need to do it carefully. But if we stay the way we are right now, in every aspect, we cannot fulfill our mission of reaching the lost in Newcastle County and planting 50 churches, the base of which will then lead us to reach the Philadelphia metropolitan area. I remember some of the elders that started with mom and dad. There were phases where dad would tell me, the elders aren't liking the change that's happening. We didn't used to have to publish a two-month schedule. You just make the announcement on Sunday that Friday you're getting together and having a potluck. And all ten people showed up. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it, it, was, it was a very simple time. It was not 
too hard. When you had a church-wide bake sale, it meant church-wide. Men came and set it up. Women baked. They, they made, I mean, everybody was involved. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not there anymore. So when I talk to you about embracing, embracing change, this is not the first shot that there's major stuff coming down the pike. No, this is saying to us that if we believe the scriptures, if God did for Israel a new thing, and if we have the example of him continuing his plan by doing something new for the early church, then we should anticipate that without destroying what should not be changed, God is going to do something new for us. Do you realize that God's done something new in us? Do you realize that this congregation worships God and ushers in the Spirit of God in a powerful way and has done so with the organ, the main instrument, and the piano, not. No guitars of any sort and no drums. We don't even have drums yet. We have percussion in that snooty. There are those within Pentecost who say, this can not happen. You cannot create the proper environment for God to be able to move. And yet God has looked down upon little old ragtag us and gone, I'm going to do something new. Now, most of you don't know that he's done something new because this is all you have known. So what next step does he need to do to do a great thing for somebody who's still out there? I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm not talking about holiness of living. I'm not talking about the things that the scriptures have locked down. I'm talking about all the other things that are simply our custom or our culture. And the real question in front of you tonight is what is your response going to be when either in the life of the church change occurs or perhaps even more importantly in your own life change occurs. I beg you, do not draw the stupid conclusion that when God wants to do something new, you need to throw out everything that you ever did before. That's foolish. Don't do that. That means you're being lazy. You won't take the time to sit down and think about how can I embrace what has brought me to this place while at the same time embracing the change that will take me to the future. You can do both because God is smart like that. But you see, we've got to be prepared. We've got to be nimble, if you will, to not be paralyzed. See, the scary part about us is we lack nothing. Change is the only thing that will keep us hungry. Hungry for the move of God. Hungry for God to do what he wants to do. We as a church lack nothing. You can afford your pastor full time. The buildings are paid for. We can hold this pattern without any change for years. Meanwhile, there are lost in this world that are dying. And we've got to be mentally and spiritually prepared to embrace change. Because I would submit to you that it's not just in the life of Israel that God says, I'm doing a new thing. Do you see it? Or are you so stuck in what you've been used to that you can't see that I'm on the move? You can't see that I'm doing something new. 
And I would submit to you that usually change within the church occurs as God begins to change the individual members of that church. So how locked down is your lifestyle? I'm not talking about holiness. I'm not talking about a new birth experience. I'm not talking about those things that are ensconced within Scripture that we are committed to. I'm talking about the patterns. Are you willing for God to do something new? I know that everybody was real excited when we bought this property and dad renovated the house along with my uncle's help and probably one other man. Maybe not even one other man at that point. And then they built the fellowship hall, the first part. If you ever want to know where the first part is, just look on the outside of it and where the drain pipe comes down in the middle of the building. That was the first building. It was a dinky little thing. But it looked huge compared to the Weight Watchers of the George Wilson Community Center or even the little house. I remember, and I even have visual memories of this, when, when they walked into that building, that first building, and, and it wasn't fully done. I think, was it on Easter that you did that? You went over, and, and the walls, you can see, there's pictures from it where there was just, it was spackled and things, the concrete. I don't think carpet was down yet, and, and, it, and, and but lights were hung, and so they went in there, and I don't even, did we have the whole service in there, or just just worship service? Went in there and sang together, and, and, and standing in there, and, and we felt like we were swimming. Because packed in the house didn't equal packed there. And I remember the same kind of comment when we moved into this facility. Packed in the fellowship hall, now we're into this facility. And, and, and so there is change that occurs. I'm trying tonight to give you a number of examples from, a different, from different vantage points that change can occur. And we're not talking about the things that are eternal or are fixed by Scripture. But there's a lot about our Christian walk, about how we carry out the work of the gospel that will require us to change. And our normal human response to change is to be resistant to it. And I'm here tonight appealing to a congregation that I believe loves God and is burdened for the loss of this world. We must intentionally allow God to prepare us and make us so that we know how to embrace change. That we navigate those waters carefully and safely. So that we don't throw away what is set by Scripture. But we also don't strangle the move of God by tradition. I hope somebody heard me because I just spoke very profound words. We must embrace change in a manner that does not let go of the eternal fixed truths of the Word of God. But that we also don't hold on to them in such a manner that we strangle them by our tradition. Because tradition isn't wrong but it's not from God. It's human. God works through it, but it's not eternal. And the hard work is letting the Spirit of God lead this church to distinguish between those. And to do it in a way that the reason we're changing is not for change's sake alone, but because God is leading us, that that change impacts our ability to carry out the mission. Now you say, what change is coming, preacher? I don't have one. That's why I think God's had me preach to you right now. Because I, I don't have anything in the front. In fact, I, I've told you everything that I think we're supposed to be doing for the next several years. So I, I don't have anything in front of my brain here. I don't, this is not the opening salvo. But if we do not deal with this inside of ourselves... We can fall short of what God wants to do through us. 
Not because of God and not because of our commitment, but because we will refuse to embrace change. Let's stand. I do feel that we need to have a time of prayer over this. Because I've, I've shared with you to the best of my ability what I felt God laid on my heart. But I, I, I really feel tonight that God needs to particularize this. Some of you, he may need to speak to you about something within your life. So would you come? Would you, would you, would you, would you come and talk to him? Maybe he's preparing you for something else within your life that's about to come. Maybe you're facing a decision. Maybe something's in front of you. Maybe something's impending. I don't know. There's a number of ways that this can go. But would you give God the opportunity to speak in particular? To take what I've shared and make it more plain and more applied in your life. Use me, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. God, I worship you and I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. God, I worship you, I worship you, I worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, I worship you and I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord, do your work within our lives. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your name, all. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your name, all. Hallelujah, hallelujah. By the way, some change is forced on you. You won't be able to avoid it no matter what you do. But there's some change that you have to embrace or it won't happen. The stuff that's forced on you, you don't have to worry about. You're going <laughs> you're going to embrace that change whether you want to or not. It might be prettier if you embrace it and deal with it, but you'll have to deal with it. It'll make you deal with it. Old age is one of those. You can go kicking and screaming or you can be a little smarter about it, but it will get you. But then there's other change in your life that you can literally pass it by. Because in order for it to affect, you have to embrace it. We're not talking about heaven or hell, but tonight I am talking about souls. I am talking about us fulfilling our mission. And at the end of the day, what else matters in this life more than the mission of this kingdom? Not, not this local church. That's not what I said. The mission of this kingdom that we're members of. That I, I don't know how to have anything be more all-consuming than that. If you don't like that about me, blame my dad. Blame my mom. They're the ones that made me that way. We don't have, we, we, we don't have other passions. There are things we do, there are things we enjoy, but we don't have other passions. That's why if you came to our family gatherings, you would be blown away. We spend most of the time discussing, arguing, or downright fighting over the kingdom. We don't fight over our houses. We don't fight over our lands. We don't discuss all of that stuff. No, it's the kingdom. We, my wife at times will look at me and say, can't we just, I go, nope, ain't happening. We cannot just have. Nope, that's not how we live. We live, we breathe, we are sold on this. I want to fulfill my mission. Whatever it is that God wants me to do in my life, I want to fulfill it. I know he's going to bless me in the midst of that, but I want to fulfill it because that is what makes this life meaningful. That's what makes this broken status that I'm in mean something instead of being hope, hopelessly depressing. Because when I look in the mirror and I see the broken me, that is hopelessly depressing. But when I place that me into the hands of the Savior and I go about and do what he's asked me to do, that... That's encouraging. That gives me hope. That gives meaning to this brief life that's here today and gone tomorrow. Heaven's going to be great, but I want to do something here. I want to do what he wants me to do here. And then when I get over there, I'll be able to see all that he did by other brothers and sisters just like me who gave their lives unto the king. And he worked the work that is amazing. And I want to be a part of that. So let God work in your life. Let him speak to you. Change his heart. It's uncomfortable. Do 
do the hard work of distinguishing between that which should not change and that which should. And embrace the change that's necessary, that's appropriate, that doesn't violate what the scriptures have solidified. As a pastor, you need to understand something. I purposefully work at destabilizing. I want you to listen very carefully to what I say here. I work intentionally at destabilizing all of the things that while they work, they don't flow out of Scripture. Because I do not want to work in the kingdom in such a way that the next generation does one of two things. Loses that which should not change or is locked into that which they may need to change. And I don't believe God has given me the authority to speak things that he hasn't already revealed in his word and make them eternal. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said, I don't have a problem that you all like to wash your hands every day, multiple times a day. But let's be clear. I didn't tell you to do that. And let's be clear. I'm not telling my disciples to do that. As they are eating corn in the middle of the field. On the Sabbath day, no less. Praise God. I asked my wife whether this made any sense. There are some sermons when I preach them, I know they make sense. Maybe they don't, but I know they do. And then there's other ones I'm not so sure. She said, well, you had to listen. So I hope you listened. If you went to sleep halfway through or partway through, do me a favor. Go listen to it again. Don't misquote me. Don't pull me out of context. Go listen to it again. Because I want God to be able to fulfill his purpose through us. And he's going to do that if we are willing to embrace the change that he needs to reach this world. Praise God. All right, all of you that are worried, Wharton, go home. Get your fuzzy pajamas on. Sit by the fire. The rest of you, enjoy yourself fellowshipping. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.